was I having reactions? You're having reactions to these red questions, uh, which are the causing the injuries. Very large response here. Not so much large here. Some there. Um, did you cause those injuries? Yeah, absolutely cause those injuries. This is 20-year-old Jeffrey Scullin after taking an FBI lie detector test and being shown that, without a doubt, he's guilty of the murder of Melinda Pleskovic. The 49-year-old teacher was five days away from becoming Jeff's mother-in-law when her body was found stabbed and shot to death in the Ohio home she shared with Jeff and the rest of her family. In this 911 call to police one week prior to his arrest, Jeff pantomimes shock at the brutal death of his almost mother-in-law. We just came home, she's on the kitchen floor. I took her son and my daughter outside. Her husband is inside with her now. So the husband attacked her? No, 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 we just came home, we just came home. You came home and found day. her injured on the floor? We found her in the kitchen, she's not moving. I, I took the kids and I walked outside. I didn't know. So, did she, she look like she was beaten or what? She, she has blood all around her. I didn't. I didn't look. I just got. I grabbed the child and left. Jeff's ability to manufacture disbelief during this 911 call explains why his family and friends were so shocked when one week after this recording he was charged with Mel's murder. In 2015, Mel and her husband Bruce welcomed Jeff into their house to live with their daughter Anna, Jeff's fiance, and the rest of their tightly knit family. The day after the murder, Jeff was interviewed at Strongsville Police Station by Detective Ron Stolls. Jeff appears confident to the point of cockiness. He will not be considered a serious suspect. This likely stems from him working a mention of his alibi of having just come home from dinner while it's true that earlier that evening Jeff had been to dinner with his fiancée, Anna Pleskovic, and her father Bruce, the time period before dinner will later prove far more relevant. What's not revealed in this 911 call is the other reason for Jeff's confidence that he'll get away with his egregious plan. The months he spent manufacturing alternative suspects in the lead-up to Mel's murder. Whether Jeff's farce will fool Detective Ron Stolls of the Strongsville Police, however, is another matter entirely. It's really Jeff. Well, let me reintroduce myself, though. I'm Detective Stolls. Okay. I appreciate you coming here voluntarily and, and talking to me. You're free to leave at any point or stop the question at any point. You're not in any trouble. You're not under arrest. All right, I'm here just to try to piece together what happened. Someone put two nails in his tire. But the, his tire was flat when he came back in the car and it moved. Mm -hmm. So someone like walked up and you know put the nails in. And then we were talking about the break in and well the attempted at break in thing and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. we just we were just talking like kind of speculated what was going on. We were all blaming a different neighbor and stuff like that. Like I think it's the girl next door, Laura, her son. In the months leading up to Mel's murder. The family made multiple complaints to police about mysterious strangers attempting to break into their house, car alarms being set off, cash disappearing from wallets, and nails stuck in tires. Jeff was the only person who claimed to have seen any of these intruders, and was also curiously present every time cash went missing or alarms were set off. Other family members mentioned the attempted break-ins during their interviews with police, but despite acknowledging Jeff was the only person to have witnessed them, it seems no one in the house seriously doubted the credibility of his claims prior to Mel's murder. Detectives, however, will not be as indulgent. Tell me about, uh, tell me about the morning. What time did you wake up? Um... Probably like 1025, because Anna had to be at work at 1040. So she woke me up to get up and watch the baby. What, what is your uh, baby's name? Aurora. Aurora. How do you spell it? A-U-O-R-A. Uh -huh. How old is Aurora? A uh, year and five months, a year and six months, give or take. I'm sorry, I'm really bad with That's okay. that stuff. Around one, Mel came home. I don't know the exact time. She didn't tell me she was coming home. She's kind of shut up. So I left. No, I didn't leave. I'm skipping ahead. I'm sorry. I'm really fucking tired. It's okay. 
Jeff's mention of his fatigue is likely intended to explain away any vagueness in his answers. Keep an eye out for how often he'll repeat this excuse over the course of the interview. So, um, what time does Kyle get home? Uh, exactly three o'clock. So I walked out at around 2.56, 2.57, and the bus is already there. Mel pulled in, and she's like, hey, what is up? You know, say hi. What time? How long were you guys outside before Mel came home? Not, no more than five minutes, if that. Okay, so she came home shortly after three. Yeah. And then I had the baby ready to go because I was going to my Aunt Jeannie's. I don't know if I, I gave the one officer her information and everything so he could call and ask if you need to. He fails to realize they will do exactly that. What time did you leave then? Like, right after. I just walked in, grabbed the baby. So as soon as Mel came home, you left right away? Literally, right away. Uh, you ran out of gas on uh, Drake Road. Did you know where at on Drake? <sighs> Within view of Gecko? The, there was a nice man who stopped. I was going to... I pulled out an umbrella, this little umbrella. I was going to walk with the baby carriage and the thing. Like, I couldn't find my phone. I didn't know where it was. But uh, I was, I was going to walk. The plan was, but someone stopped and asked if I needed help. And I gave him $10 and he went and filled the gas can up and brought it back. He was very nice. Jeff goes into excessive detail about running out of gas and the good Samaritan he claims stopped to help. This amount of unprompted information is sometimes indicative of a person being untruthful. So it's not surprising that police will ascertain, without too much difficulty, that the Good Samaritan does not exist. So he fills them up. I figure worst case is he steals my gas tank and ten dollars. Best case is he came back and he, I mean he seemed like a really nice old guy. He had red Lincoln and pulls up and asked if I was okay. Jeff's decision to concoct a complicated story while being unconcerned with how easily it would unravel is another indication of his high degree of arrogance and overconfidence that he would not be a suspect. It is now up to detectives to determine why he would go to such lengths to create this false narrative. And then you go to your, uh, your aunt's yes. on Abigail. On Abigail Lane. Is uh, anybody home? Yeah, Jeannie was there. Okay, do you know what time you get there now? How long does all this take? Mm -hmm. You left shortly after 3. What time do you think you got to her house? Probably 4.30. That's a long time. I was stuck there for whatever. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't find my phone. Jeff attempts to account for the time between supposedly leaving home just after 3 p.m. and arriving late to his aunt's house at 4.30 p.m. This is only a nine-minute drive. So Detective Stolls is understandably suspicious as to why he was so late, even considering Jeff's story of running out of gas. Later on, investigators will uncover facts which will make this timeline even harder to believe. From there, where did you go from your aunt's house? To Applebee's. We went straight to Applebee's. We were all supposed to meet there originally, but Anna told Bruce to go there, and she told me to go there. And the clothes that you uh, allowed us to take, was that what you wore into? That was what I was wearing since I left three. Okay. Left at three o'clock. The clothes that I was wearing before then, I pointed out to you at the bottom of the stairs, it was like kind of pajama clothes. It was just sweatpants and a tight t-shirt. You were welcome to take those ones though if you wanted to. And you wait for Bruce to get there, and then what kind of conversation? Does Bruce come in with anything? Uh, he sat down and he asked if I talked to Mel. I was like, no, have you talked to Mel? We were all trying to figure out what's going on. Anna walked over. We were all talking like, when was the last time you talked to her? When was the last time you do this? Did you guys leave Applebee's together? Yeah. And then when I pulled in the driveway, he was already waiting by the door. And, you know, it seems everything was normal. You know, Kyle opened the door, the lights were all on, nothing seemed out of place, just looking in. I reached in, put the baby to the right like I always do because the one door doesn't open, so I always put her to the right. And I went back out, grabbed her bag, grabbed my phone, wallet, and I walked in. And then when I was walking back, like about to round the garage, Bruce started screaming about something. I ran in, Kyle picked up the baby and moved her in the living room, the room with the TV, where the couch was, the L couch. Um, he put him in there, so I walked in and ran over so to the So you baby. put the baby right in the foyer right there, to the right, by the stairs? Yeah, right where the base of the stairs was. You heard Bruce, what did Bruce scream? I don't know what he screamed at first. I just kind of heard him yell. 
So I ran in, I thought something was wrong with the baby. Didn't see her at the door, was yelling, where's the baby, where's the baby? Look, ran into the kitchen, saw her to the right, ran over there, looked at her, nothing was wrong. He was screaming in the kitchen. I thought something was wrong. I turned around and Mel was laying down. So you you went in, you went to the right for the baby? You didn't look? Well, Is that what you said? I looked, but I didn't see. You know, I just looked for the little carrier because I was afraid something was wrong with her. Based on Jeff's disclosures about where he placed his infant daughter, Detective Stolls believes it's unlikely Jeff didn't see the pool of blood in the kitchen and Mel's body. Jeff's insistence that he didn't initially see Mel's body again raises the question of why he's choosing to tell these untruths. How quickly he saw the body of his mother-in-law has no bearing on his guilt, so the detective is justifiably confused. Stolls doesn't challenge Jeff on these numerous inconsistencies at this point, however. This will wait until Jeff has told his story in its entirety. Did you call 911? I did. I think he called as well, but I'm not sure. Were you outside when you called 911? Yes. I ran straight out to the truck. It was rain when I was making my way to the truck. Uh, we talked a little bit at the house. Um, there's weapons in the home. Yes. Those are your uh, fathers? And yes. When did you bring those into the home? The other day. Uh, yesterday. And why did you bring those in? Because I didn't want to drive around with them in case I got pulled over. That's the only time they were in the house. I why, did, why did he ask you to take them? Uh, we were going, he didn't ask me to take them. We were going to the gun show in that car. And why wouldn't you just put them back in his house? I never got a chance to stop back over there. You could check them all. None of them have been fired or anything. And then there's a hunting knife in there as well. You could test all of them. Go ahead. And when was the last time you fired a gun? I fired a gun. Not in a few weeks. Probably a month or two. Months. Yeah. I have handled weapons that he has shot, though. I'm saying there might be stuff on my hands from that. I don't know how long it stays on or anything like that. Jeff, but you have, you said you're afraid to drive around with those guns. The other ones you you took inside, and then why would this one, why would you not take this one inside? I did not intentionally take those guns, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry if I'm not explaining things well. I'm very tired. Does that make sense, sir? Uh, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit further about it. Jeff's confidence is clearly wavering as he shakes his hands in the air and seeks reassurance from the detective that his story makes sense. Stolls refrains from granting Jeff this approval, however, and instead seeks to further undermine his confidence by challenging more elements of his narrative. Jeff, let's go back to... When your car breaks down, it's just an awfully long time to be on Drake Road for an hour and a half. And so when you say... Oh, was, was I there for an hour? I wasn't there for an hour and a half. I was there less than that. But you're there You're there for an hour. You, you said you were there for an hour and a half. That's <sighs> bad, I guess. So, really long time. And then, then you tell me you can't find your phone. I didn't have my phone. I didn't know where it was. You said you couldn't find it. I know, but I'm, I'm saying okay. like I didn't physically have it. Okay, but you it. could get it. You just got to go to the back, you said, and, and grab it. Yeah, but I didn't know if I left it at the house or what. Like, I was looking, and then when I finally, like, when the nice man got me some gas, and I got to the gas station, I sat, sat down, looked, you know, looked in the car, looked everywhere, opened the back door, reached back, looked through all that. How long were you sitting there before that guy came and helped you? Maybe 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. And no more than that 20, 30 minutes, did you want to go see if you left your phone at the house or go to check the car? I didn't have gas. You know, no, what I'm asking though is, I said it wrong, in that 20 to 30 minutes, you didn't want to check your car to see if you left the I phone at the house? I around, but I didn't want to hop out on Drake and open up both doors with cars. But even them. describing those seats, knowing that it drops down there and where it ends up, would be pretty... I mean, I looked around, I didn't see it. Like, the way... I guess I could have done it better. I'm sorry if I'm not explaining things right I'm very tired. I'm in bed. Jeff, how did you get the scratches on your face? I had a little bumper with the truck. I got tapped. That's from me hitting the steering wheel. A police report? No, 
There's no damage on either of the cars. This side, I don't know what that is. This is what hit me. Yeah, what is on this side? So you hit a steering wheel that's round, so these are going down. They scratch marks. I don't think so. It was there last night. It's just from something else. It could be from the solving unit. But this all was there last night. You can ask Anna, Bruce, all of them. And if you need to, I guess you can test my face. I don't know if that's an actual thing. Strangely, he doesn't consider that forensic testing will not be in his best interest. Not only do Jeff's suggestions not divert Stahl's attention, if anything, it's a sign to the detective that the investigation is on the right track. Jeff's obvious insecurity is something the detective can take advantage of. And he does so by attempting to lock Jeff into incriminating himself further while his defenses are down. Um, in the process of eliminating you know, the people that were there on the scene, would you take a polygraph test? What's that? Uh, a lie detector test. Um, sure. Actually, you know what? Wait. I'll talk to my mother about it first, but I mean, I guess I'd be open to it. Well, did, I thought those things don't work. They're very accurate. Huh? Huh? Never mind. I just go off stuff I saw on TV. Okay. Did you have? Do you have any involvement in Mel's death? Any? Any knowledge? No. Of anybody? No. Besides being there. there. Who do you think would do something like this? She's she's nice. She's well liked. She's a teacher. Everybody knows her and loves her. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, we do butt heads every once in a while. Like we yell at each other about little stuff, but it's like, who doesn't? If I had to say someone who did it, I would probably say the person that tried to break in the other day. There's a police report about that. Someone tried to open the door while I was there. Mm -hmm. What do you want, like? I don't, Bruce gets all mad sometimes, like when he drinks, but I, he wasn't drinking or anything today, I don't think. But that's the only thing I can think of. Like she's told us a few times if he comes home, like when he's drinking, just to leave or call the cops and stuff. But I really doubt he would do that. He really loves her. I think he really cares about her. But everyone, I mean, She's great. I don't know anyone who would hurt her. She's a teacher. After Stolls challenges Jeff by asking point blank if he had anything to do with Mel's death, Jeff attempts to retreat to his dual comfort zones, extolling Mel's virtues and pinning the blame on intruders. He further seeks cover in irrelevant truths by reiterating that Mel's profession was, in fact, teaching. Detective Stolls is disinterested cutting Jeff off to return to the subject of his actions after Mel's body was discovered. This subject, clearly far removed from Jeff's comfort zone, serves to further unsettle him. People come up to the back door all the you time. You know, it would, seems odd to me is when you heard Bruce screaming. You said initially you were afraid it's the baby, yeah. but you, you'd come in, you'd go to the scream, so you're looking for Bruce, number one. And then well, it's really with the baby because Kyle's. Well, you're assuming that you're wondering if it's the baby, and you're gonna. And Bruce is screaming, so he must see something. With he the just baby. screamed once. He wasn't constantly screaming. If okay. That's what so he screamed. Yes. You're worried about the baby, so you're gonna go to Bruce because you're assuming the baby's by him, right? I was just looking for the baby. That's all I gotta say, I guess. I just I wanted to make sure my daughter was safe. There's no way, Jeff, there's no way you could see him, see that he's there, and then and go to the right but without seeing Mel. There's no way. Especially in a small kitchen like that. I don't know. I just didn't. I don't know what you want me to say. Oh, well, it's just not believable. This is impossible to, to walk in that house, to look over and see Bruce, the guy that yelled, and not to be like, what's wrong? And then there's no way you can miss that. Yeah, I definitely have a hard time with a couple parts of your story, but... Um, what parts are you having a hard time with, well, sir? 
like I said, you know, Drake Rowe, it was an awful long time to be there. And then it is, again, it is so difficult for me to understand you looking over and not, not seeing anything. Jeff's first police interview concludes. After the sharp note that the last interview ended on, detectives opt to feed Jeff's illusion that his stories are working. But despite the detectives' assurances here, Jeff's days as a free man are numbered. So real quick, you know, again, if you're in any trouble, you know, you're free to go. We're, uh, we're just going to talk, um, go over everything, see if we missed anything. We're looking for help from anybody. So right now we don't have anything um, that is concrete, you know, is the best way to put it. So when we do, you know, we'll tell, we'll tell you and the family. The investigators want to lower Jeff's defenses and keep him talking. By this point, they have solid evidence his intruder story is false. But before they drop that particular bomb, they give Jeff the chance to incriminate himself with even more lies. And you just you just talked about uh, or mentioned the attempt to break in at that door. Uh, tell me about that. So. Uh. I was in the kitchen doing dishes. The big dog, the big black dog, I don't know if you met him, he's Joey Big Black Black. He was laying next to the door, and the cats, they jump on the, they like jump on the door when they want to let in. Be let in, they jump on this glass door and it kind of wiggles a little bit, like, you know, it makes a noise. They're outside. So I, yeah, they're outside half the time inside. So I just thought it was the cats, and then, you know, it made a big noise, and the dog ran over and started barking like crazy, and when I rounded that banister thing, I saw the guy's hand, and I realized someone was trying to get in. This is a white, hairy hand. That's it. When you say it is the hand, was the hand outside pulling on the door? Or is it was inside, like they were reaching for a lock or something. Like a... Mm, can I use your clipboard? Yeah. Like a... If this is the door here, and that's like the top of the silver lock on the sliding door, mm -hmm. it was like this, and he was pushing it. Like, you know, I don't know if you thought you could reach an out for a block or something. The first of these alleged break-ins witnessed solely by Jeff occurred in August, which means he had been planning to use these stories as an alibi at least two months prior to Mel's murder. In relation to his elaborate pre-murder planning, however, Detective Stolls will have to endure another 90 minutes of descriptions of fictitious would-be trespassers. Here are some moments that highlight just how rehearsed this phase of Jeff's cycle of offending was. Yeah, she was wearing a pink shirt when she went upstairs, and she came down wearing a green shirt. When she went upstairs and she changed, she was wearing a, a pink shirt, and then she changed into a green shirt. I don't know if she was wearing the same pants, I just knew. I just noticed the color change in shirt. I don't know if she changed pants or anything like that. I just remember the difference of color. Kyle has hit her a few times, so I got scared, yes. I don't like it when Kyle moves the baby. He's hit her a few times, it's kind of scary, but... While these lies reveal Jeff's dedication to detail, he fails to muster the same effort when talking about Mel. So to think of, to think of somebody who, you know, is evil enough to do it, it it's... Who could do something like that? I mean, anybody who knew her. I mean, she's the greatest person. Like, you know, granted, you know, everyone has arguments. Everyone, me and Bruce had an argument the other day. We were cool the next day. But I don't get how anyone would be able to do that. Like, yeah, you don't, you don't see that. I've never seen anything like that. It, it's rare when it's, that, when it's that brutal, she's that brutally attacked. I haven't even been a part of, not even really a part of the family that long, and, you know, people... And she took you in. Yeah. I mean, did she's you consider, you consider her mom? Yeah, I mean, I never called her mom, but she basically was. She helped me with a lot of stuff. She, you know, she, she's great with Aurora. Aurora loves her. Jeff falls back on his standard characterization of Mel as someone who was well-liked. This generic descriptor connotes Jeff's inclination to impersonalize Mel, a tactic common to murderers who detach any emotional connection to their victims to enable them to commit their violent acts. Patrol officer Eric Schubert, who transported Jeff and Bruce to the station prior to Jeff's first interview, writes in his report. While waiting with Mr. Scullin, he began making conversation with me. 
I did not ask any questions related to the case, but Mr. Scullin repeatedly stated that this was going to ruin his wedding the upcoming weekend. I noticed that Mr. Scullin didn't mention his soon-to-be mother-in-law, the victim, once, nor did he ever mention any sort of empathy for her. At this point, Detective Stoles still doesn't have enough evidence to arrest Jeff, so another interview ends. Fortunately, investigators will uncover damning evidence between now and Jeff's next interview, including CCTV footage that will pull his story apart at the seams. Okay, so roughly you leave the house at 310. To, yeah. go, to go to your Aunt Jeannie's. I think so, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm really... I'm not trying to be difficult, but... I'm just really well, I mean, I'm not looking for down at the minute, but can we agree? I mean, Kyle gets gets home. Melinda comes home pretty much right afterwards. So then you get your stuff ready. As soon as she walked in, I left, yeah. Okay. Uh, that happens all the time, though, where, like... One person walking, it's kind of can't stay by himself. Right. But, so the, but we know we know Kyle got home and she came home very shortly after. She's right there. Would have been ten or fifteen minutes. The man who seemingly materialized in the room is Bureau Sergeant Greg Cravatis, whose presence sets the tone for a more formal, focused interrogation. As Jeff, likely intimidated by the sergeant's presence, becomes more vague in his timeline, he goes overboard with false sensory details. For your worst case is he steals my gas tank and ten dollars. And I gave him ten dollars to put in there. I gave him one of the tanks. I figured the worst case is he's gonna steal, you know, my ten bucks and tank and that'll be the end of it. Whatever. I gave him a gas can and ten dollars. Mm-hmm. And I figured worst case he'd steal my ten bucks in a gas can and I'd still be stuck there. The detail and consistency of Jeff's lies would be impressive if it weren't for the fact he's playing into investigators' hands. He's more comfortable and confident reciting his story, which will only make the upcoming rug pull more devastating. Uh, do you know that there's cameras in your in the back facing your house? No. There is. Where? On the playground, Deerfield. Okay. And it literally it's your house and if you're in the backyard to the house to the right of you. All right. You didn't know that? No. Uh, the Thursday before this happened, someone tried to get into the house? Yes. Well, that camera captures the back of your house. Nobody came to your house. Well, then someone was... Sir, I'm telling you what I saw. But I'm telling you what was captured on surveillance camera. The moment the detective reveals the existence of CCTV footage that discredits Jeff's intruder narrative, Jeff's facade of assuredness crumbles. His deferential use of sir suggests he is cognizant of the ruinous shift in dynamics and the power differential that has occurred between himself and the detective. Stoll's challenge to Jeff's intruder narrative now makes plain the elephant in the room. Why would he make this up? You said you he came to the door, you got to the door, and Moose tried uh, to get him. It's unfortunate Jeff is no longer wearing the loading wheel shirt from his first interview, as this confrontation has left his brain buffering. Investigators are going to increase this cognitive load by similarly destroying the other tent poles of his narrative. And furthermore, do you know I talked to your Aunt Jeannie? Yeah. Did she tell you what we spoke about? No. She didn't? You were there last night. Okay, did she tell you my conversation with her? No. Did you tell your Aunt Jeannie that Moose bit the guy and there was blood everywhere? I did do that to make, because my mom, mother and father don't like the dog. So you lied to your aunt? I did. I said that to my parents too. You can ask them. Okay. So that didn't happen? What didn't happen? Someone tried to get your house. I th- the door moved and everything though. Jeff, you said you saw a hand. Let's let's come let's get this part straight. You saw him run right away. That's what we saw. Mm-hmm. So your aunt didn't share our conversation, so let me no. Let me uh, tell you a little bit more about it. You didn't get to your aunt's until 6 o'clock. I'm sorry, what? I, s- I saw somebody. Okay, it didn't happen. I 
Jeff, do you know where I'm going with this? I do, but I don't never Where, where am I going with this? You probably could say that I did it, right? Do you know what time Melinda really got home that day? Because it wasn't at three, like you said. It's whenever she got home. I don't know. I don't know. Well, let me just tell you this. It was much later than what you're telling me. Melinda doesn't come home when you say she comes home. What time did she get home? Doesn't matter. It's much later than what you're telling me. So your whole... Remember when we first talked? I questioned you. You looked a little irritated about how long, even at that point, when I didn't know as much as I know now, and you said you left at 3. Melinda came home, you left right away. You said you didn't get your aunts until 4.30. And even I questioned that. I said, it's an awfully long time to from... From uh, Blazing Star to Abigail is roughly what? How many miles? I can Four, it. five. So I questioned it. You seemed you seemed uh, aggravated that I would even question it. I said that's an awfully long time to get from point A to B, run out of gas when someone came and helped you twenty to thirty minutes after you broke down. So now, not only. Is the hour and a half, now the hour and a half becomes three hours. Three hours from when you told me you left, and then by the time you get to your aunt's. So what happens in that time frame? I left when she came home. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm... She walked in the door, I walked out. Jeff. Sorry. I'm sorry. You okay? I'm shocked. I don't know what's... Confusion and fatigue have now taken the place of cockiness in Jeff's body language. This change in demeanor appears genuine, likely a manifestation of his inability to explain away his many mistakes. Stoll's revelation that Jeff is their prime suspect is highly unlikely to help him regain his former confidence. Detectives often choose not to handcuff suspects until the end of the interview, if at all. Given Jeff's stubborn denial, however, along with his mantra of, I didn't do anything, sir, investigators cuff him to emphasize the direness of his situation. Am I being charged with something? Yes. So, let me tell you this. Let me just tell you this, okay? All right, listen to me. Okay, you're under arrest. Hear me out. You're under arrest, okay, for the murder of Melinda Pleskovic. Okay? So, why don't you stand up, face away from me. I didn't do, anything, do you have anything sir. on you that shouldn't be on you? No. No, no, I don't. If successful, this tactic may work to break down Jeff's basic strategy of deny, deny, deny. Jeff, look at me, okay? Look at me. All right. What happened that day that would make you do something like this? Because you don't seem like the type to do this. I didn't do anything wrong. I, she, she took me in. I never... Right. That, and that help, help me understand, help this family understand. Jeff, when I asked you, does this family get along? You said, yeah. You said, it's a great family. You said, they took you in. Melinda was paying for your wedding. We have talked to a number of people. You know who was, you know who was the most, exciting about, most excited about your wedding? <sighs> Melinda. Everybody we spoke to talked about how excited she was for you to marry her daughter. I'm sorry. Can we move? These around me. Are they? Yeah, I'm like, my hands are hurting a little bit. Sure. They feel better? Yeah, okay. My shoulder was hurting. Sure. You want something to drink? I didn't, I didn't you, hurt anybody. Do you want something to drink? Would you like something to drink? I'm, I'm okay. Okay. Everybody we spoke to, Melinda was very excited for your wedding. Okay. You brought her a granddaughter. So what happened that day that would lead you to do this? Because you don't seem like the type to do it. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Jeff, listen. 
You can make this better or worse. Sir, I didn't do anything. Okay. You must have a ton of pressure on you. And you, you could probably take a lot of this pressure off starting now to do the right thing and help everybody understand what happened that would lead you to do this. I'm sorry, but I didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't hurt anybody. But you did, and I want to understand why. I didn't do anything. I didn't hurt anybody. Jeff, you have an 18-month-old She's my world. Daughter. I would never. Your world. They would, so do you I would want never to start, see her do you, again. Do you want to start making this right so you can see her one day? Or do you want to keep going down this path? I'm not trying to go down a path. I didn't do anything, sir. I would never do anything. Jeff, did something happen that day that just made you really angry really fast? No. Was, was, was Melinda uh, an irritant to you about the wedding or anything like that? No. Did you guys have words that day? Yeah. And what happened? We, we talked about little stuff and then she went to the doctor. What, what were the... She always, she what were the just, things that Melinda would do that would sort of push your buttons? That would just get under your skin? Just little comments, like she made comments, you know, little insults, but whenever she did anything like that, I'd just go downstairs, so I wouldn't. How would she insult you? Just like when she'd make comments about weight or anything like that, it's little stuff, nothing, nothing. Right. Nothing. Jeff. Jeff. Okay. We, we have the murder weapon. What? What's the murder weapon? We have the knife. It has your DNA on it, and it has her blood on it. So how is that possible? I, I don't know. I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't do anything. Listen, Jeff. I don't believe you intended to. I really don't. While we've investigated this, we've learned a lot about you as well. I don't know that you're, I don't know that you're a bad person, but... Something happened that day that really, uh, really got you upset. What did Melinda do that got you so upset? Nothing. I, it was, we didn't even talk that much. We talked more about the baby than anything. Yeah. Well, what happened that day that got you upset? Jeff, listen. We all have emotions. They I've all happen in, in different ways. Something made you, something made you very upset that day. Give us, give us an explanation for that. Give us an understanding. I told you, we've been working on this case for a week now, and we understand you. I mean, I don't think you're a bad person. I talked to people you worked with at Berea schools, okay? I've done a lot on this. What happened to, what happened to Jeff that day? What got you upset? Because people have been telling me that you're not a bad guy. I would never hurt her. I, if, if I got upset, I would just walk away like I always do. Mm -hmm. I never, never hurt anybody. We're not talking about anybody, Jeff. We're talking about I Melinda. I never hurt Melinda. I never touched Melinda. I From now on, Jeff takes care to refer to Melinda by her name, indicating he is still motivated by self-preservation. Unfortunately for him, this will not be enough to save himself from the next key stage of this investigation as the pressure rockets skywards. Who's that? That's my daughter. Right. Do you want to see her ever again? I do. Do you want to see her again? This is your opportunity to see her again. If not, you're not going to see her again. Do you know the difference between premeditated murder and aggravated murder is? Because I feel that you planned this from the get-go. All that bullshit that we went out there, all the stuff going on at the alarms, you got the whole community in a, in a, in a tizzy. That's you. All right? Okay. So how do you want to make this better? Do you want to see Aurora or not? I do. All right? Because I tell you right now, we're going to go after the premeditated murder. And do you know what happens with that? The death sentence. You're not going to be around very long. 
Do you want do you want that or do you want to do the right thing and see her? You're telling me you didn't do it? Look at me, Jeff. If the roles were reversed and I was sitting there, I would do everything I can to prove my innocence. Everything. Listen, you're not looking at me anymore. To do everything. You know where I would start? I offered you a polygraph the other day. Take a polygraph. Prove yourself. So do you want to take a polygraph? I, my mom told me to ask her about all that stuff. I don't know. You, you must, don't make decisions by asking your mom. Now, Jeff, you're under arrest for murder and you're an adult. You don't make decisions now by asking your mom. Okay, you're beyond that. You're, you're way beyond that. When Jeff ultimately agrees to the polygraph, the simple act of participation does not ease any pressure whatsoever. As he moves through the process, the next phase of interrogation sees investigators intensifying the pressure by equating confessing with the only way Jeff can maintain a relationship with Anna and their daughter, Aurora. Let's see where we stand. Let's look at our... We use an algorithm. We're not allowed to look at it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I want you to look. I'm going to show you the stuff. You know, there's no magic. There's no, uh, there's no magic. You have uh, probably 99.9. You have a significant reaction. Let me see. What are the questions you're having issues on? Okay. What? Um, five and seven, did you? Okay. What was I having reactions? You're having reactions to these red questions, uh, which are the causing the injuries, knowing for sure. I want to take a look at the chart. And very large response here. Not so much large here. Some there. This new interviewer is Lance Fagamelli a special agent and polygraph examiner for the FBI. Jeff's failure to deceive is glowing on a screen before him, color-coded red and presented in empirical terms. The way Lance discusses the polygraph results is noticeably certain. It's no longer a question of whether Jeff did it, but of why. Lance's strategy only works if Jeff believes in the polygraph. If the agent discusses the results as gospel, he leaves no room for denial. Um, did you cause those injuries? Yeah, absolutely cause those injuries. Um, now what I want to do is get an understanding of why it happened. That's what we, what we need to do is what happened, what caused it, what did Melinda do uh, that, that, that caused a response from you? What did you do? Let me think here. And so what I want to do is be able to move us towards this verification test, first and foremost to show that it's not an intentional thing. By openly positioning the verification test post-polygraph as Jeff's best chance to convince investigators the murder wasn't premeditated, Lance makes it appear he's not interested in manipulating or deceiving Jeff. The investigators understand, however, that Jeff planned Mel's murder for months. So this talk of intentionality shouldn't be taken at face value as their real theory. The interviewer's seeming transparency with this method allows a window into the classic first step of getting a suspect to admit to a lesser crime. In this case, a spontaneous and unintentional one before working towards obtaining a full confession. Did you intentionally plan to hurt her? Was there a plan? It happened, and what I'm trying to f figure out is why it happened, and to make sure that it wasn't a cold, calculated thing. I don't want people to draw. Never hurt anybody. Intentionally. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I would never hurt anybody intentionally. So, what caused it? What did she say or do? That knife was in the bag. Okay, in the bag. And there were guns in the bag. Yeah, but I never... What did she do? Was the bag with you? Or was it in the it premise? Was, it was in the, in the house, okay. downstairs. Okay. And downstairs is where you live, right? Yeah, that's okay. where we stay. Okay. So, were you... Did you have, did you have the knife and gun upstairs and then she said things or said something yeah. and a reaction. I mean, I don't carry those around. Okay. They stay. They stay or downstairs. And right. Or downstairs. Right. I recognize the knife. Right. Well, let's talk about. We know what happened. Okay. 
Let's talk about why and, and try to get an understanding that, because you said yourself, and I'm going to write this down, I never intentionally hurt her. Unfortunately, the situation happened. I, you know what? I would love to make it go away. I would love to make it go away. But we can't. Um, and the way we move forward is helping everybody understand what's going on, okay? I mean, you have Anna, you love Anna. You have a daughter, okay? You want to maintain a relationship. You want to maintain a relationship for the rest of your life with your daughter. You want to maintain a, a, a relationship with Anna. How do we do that in this scenario, in this situation? By being truthful. You have all, all the marriage stress going on. I, I'm married. I, I know it's stressful. You got a brand new baby who you love dearly. You got a wife or a, a, a fiance. A, 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 you're living with the in-laws. Lance dangles the carrots that Jeff may be able to salvage his relationship with Anna and their daughter. Appealing to Jeff's desire to minimize his crime, the agent characterizes the murder as a mistake. If Jeff takes the bait, he can tell himself he's responsible for a lesser offense. You know what that shows? That shows a scared guy. That would show a guy that's just scared to hell. You know what? Oh my God, I made a mistake. You know, this, this is my future. This is my wife's mother. She's generally a good person. I just couldn't take something that was said or something that she did. And that's what I want to test on. Because you know why? If I can test on it, then I, it backs you. Otherwise, you know, people can draw whatever conclusions they want. And we don't want that. We want you to have a relationship with your daughter. We want you to have a relationship with Anna. When you and Anna fight, you kiss and make up, mm -hmm. right? And, and I, and I kind of, you know, I'm kind of metaphorically saying, it's the same thing. Obviously, this isn't quite the same thing, but the mechanisms towards reconciliation for who you are as a person don't ever stop. You make mistakes. Hey, I made a mistake. I want to move forward. You know, I don't like, I don't like it. This is not who I am. I'm scared of the future. I want us to have a future together. I'm deathly afraid of that. That's fine. But you can't run from it. You can't hide from it. To run. Because where are you right now? You're sitting in an orange jumpsuit. Okay. Why? Because all the evidence is there. There's guys up there that say, why are you, would you even spend your time talking to that guy? Who gives a damn? They got all the evidence in the world. Did you see what happened? You know, and you're like, wait a minute. That's not the global person. Maybe that's a social worker in me. Maybe that's a person who cares. Maybe that's a person who sees the goodness in you. I do, and other people do. Anna does. If Jeff falls for this face-saving lie, it's one step closer, according to Lance, towards winning his family back. What I'd like us to do at the end of the night, write a letter to Anna. Tell her you're sorry. Explain it. You don't have to go into graphic detail, but tell her this is not who you are. I don't remember doing it. I remember leaving and getting gas. I don't understand. Right, I don't remember. I, I understand. don't understand. Well, let's talk about blackouts then. I don't remember uh, hurting her. I don't remember leaving the house. So, I, I left the house though. I left the house and she walked in like any other day. You did leave the house. You didn't leave the house with her, how she walked in. What are you most scared of? Never see my daughter again. Exactly. Okay, let's talk about that. Then let's talk about that. Uh, that's a very fair thing to be scared of. Okay. How do you how do you take control of the situation? Can you change the past? Can you change the past? Uh, no. No. Exactly. I can't change the past. There's things in my life that I've done that I've regret, and I'll regret to the last day of my life. But you know what? What do people do when they make decisions they regret? They don't want to go back there, okay? They say what? I'm sorry. 
I did make a mistake. Okay? You can't make a person forgive you, but you can give them everything, the, every opportunity. You can never quit on them. Okay? And that's what you need to do with your daughter. You need to give her the truth. You need to never quit on her. You will be able to see her. You will be involved with her in her life. But if you alienate Anna, I, I, you know, I can't control Anna. You owe Anna the same thing. You've got to tell her the truth. You've got to level with her. You've got to tell her what, what went on and, and why. You know, you know if, if it's something so callous that you said, you know, I hated Melinda and I planned out for weeks to kill her and then I killed her. Well, yeah, I don't think Anna's going to be forgiven of that. I don't think a lot of people would be. But as I believe, this is a mistake. This is an isolated situation, an argument ensured, ensured. Something happened that caused a reaction, something inside of you that said, I've had enough of this, I'm tired of being disrespected, and you reacted. It wasn't the best day, it wasn't the best thing to do. But tell people, tell people, let them know the truth, that you're a human being. We're going to write a letter to them. Well, I'm going to have you write a letter to your daughter and your wife and telling them the truth. I don't I know that you, stuff is downstairs. Right. How do you define who you are by being truthful? Letting Anna, letting your beloved daughter know the truth. Not making a spectacle of yourself, not making putting any more pressure on them and helping them. And you know, by helping them, you know who else you help? You help you. Because you know what? They're still going to love you. They're not going to be happy with you, but they're still going to love you. Can I have a minute to myself? Sure. Okay, I'm going to walk out for a few minutes, okay? Think about it, talk about it, get your head straight, and we'll, we'll come back and work on those letters. Okay. My head's killing me. Yeah. What do we want to say to Aurora? What do we want to say to Anna? Let's tell them. Let's do a letter to them and let them know what happened and why. Uh, dear Anna, Okay, dear Aurora. Okay. I want to make sure I spell her name. A U R O R A. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, I love you very much. Um, I remember being mad. I just don't remember doing anything else. Okay. Uh, in reference to Aurora. Dear Aurora, I love you very much. Do you want to tell her how you feel? Yeah. Okay. I love you so much. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you want to apologize? I, I'm so sorry. You don't want to apologize? No, I do. Okay. I did do something bad. What is came Okay. Well, how about we phrase it that way and we'll, and we'll talk about it. I am so sorry for doing something bad. Repeated attempts to entice Jeff into dictating this letter don't play out as the detective hopes, as Jeff still clings on to hope that he may be able to avoid taking full responsibility for Mel's death. Lance now pivots towards targeting what he believes is Jeff's greatest vulnerability, his infant daughter. You, you would never mean for Melinda to die or to get hurt, right? No. Okay. Well, here, I would never purposely hurt Melinda like that. I never intended her to die. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I don't know if you want to put this part in there. Ultimately, we got to talk about this part, and, and, and we can. You know, between you and I, we can. I don't know if you want to put this with Aurora, because that might be a little too graphic. It is. 
about the stabbings or the shootings, you know, we have to address that so we can move forward. Hey, look, you know, obviously you were angry. I get it. You never had any intention for her to show it's not a premeditated thing. It's not a planned out thing. You know, I got mad and I shot and stabbed her or I shot her or I stabbed her or I pulled out a gun. I didn't think there was any bullets in it. And then, I, and, and then it did and it went off. You know, I didn't realize it went off, and it did. Maybe the gun just popped. It just went off. It, it went off because ultimately you pulled the trigger. You and I both know that. But if your intention was not to shoot her, I was just so mad when I grabbed the gun, it went off, and I didn't plan on shooting her. Then let her know that. Well, then I got shot. That's never going to go away. That's never going to change. Tell her the truth. Is that a fair representation? Uh, yes. Okay. She went downstairs and found that stuff, I'm pretty sure, or she was looking through stuff. Oh, okay. She also had uh, a piece of paper that Aurora might not have been mine for the longest time. What's and that? Oh. An infidelity committed on Anna's part. Okay. Okay. Which was an iffy subject with me and Anna. Okay. So she's in your room. She finds the gun that ultimately was used that that was used in the shooting. She found the knife. She found the knife because it was with the gun. She found a a paternity test. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the paternity test shows that you're the father. Yeah. Okay. This creates a lot of anger in you, as you said. It makes me mad. And, you know, maybe you maybe you grabbed the gun and then it went off. Is that what happened? Is that when you grabbed the gun and it went off? Yes. Okay. What was the reason for that? That's what I want to understand. That's what we, we need to let Aurora know. She picked it up and kind of didn't necessarily point it at me, but pointed it near me. Oh my God. It wasn't at, at me. So she was threatening you. You took she it as a... She was screaming at me. Okay. I didn't know they hit her so bad. Okay. So she's screaming at you. She picks up the gun, points it in your direction. What do you do? Do you grab it from her? That's where I don't understand. Well, you got it somehow. Father, What's that? I just reached up and grabbed it. Okay. I reached up and grabbed it, and and that's when you responded and, and it went off? So you felt threatened by her? For a minute, yes. Okay, okay. I felt uh, threatened by her, and, 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 and that's what made you, is that what made you so mad? No, she was yelling. Aurora isn't yours, Aurora isn't yours. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to answer it all. I'm okay. Have you told me the truth? Yes, sir. Okay. Are you hiding anything? No, I'm sorry. Are you, are you trying to minimize any involvement or anything else? What is that one? Uh, you you're trying to hide. Oh, I'm sorry. My, my mistake. Are you trying to hide what happened? Okay. And once again, that was not a planned out thing. You didn't plan this three weeks earlier, a year earlier. Okay. Okay. While Jeff still play acts disassociation, investigators keep the intensity high, leading in to the fourth and final interview. I think it's perfectly natural for you to uh, not be able to recall the exact time. Now, to be hours off is another story, but, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes here and there, I think that's understandable. I think that was, that had have been a, a traumatic day for you. Is, is now the the million dollar question. I have one more question. Sure. You can leave these on, but can you lose them a little bit? The lady did put them on. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Thank you. Jeff, it sounds like when Melinda came home uh, the second time, I know you're having some time, difficulty remembering or recalling, and again, I don't, I'm not asking for it on the minute, but would I be mistaken? Does it sound? It sounds like this happened pretty quickly after she got home. Would that be true? I, yeah. Uh huh. 
Jeff has finally acknowledged that he was responsible for Mel's death. At the start of this final police interrogation with Detective Stolls, the detective's demeanor is notably warmer than his previous interaction with Jeff. This softer tone lulls Jeff into a position of comfort, reciting his new narrative, similar to his presentation with the FBI agent. Jeff's story has been picked apart, piece by piece. Between CCTV footage disproving the burglary tales, his nonsensical gas station story, and his arrival at Aunt Jeannie's, nothing adds up. In the moments following the murder, Jeff was lucid enough to text Bruce using Mel's phone. Do you remember using Melinda's phone? No, I don't think I did. I might have, I don't know. You might have? If, 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 I, if I told you about a certain text message, you, that would help you? Uh, sure. Do you remember texting Bruce for him to meet Melinda somewhere? No. Using her phone? Why do you say you might have used her phone? Everything was all blurry for the longest time. I couldn't. I'm still having trouble trying to figure out what happened. Mm -hmm. what's, well, what's not real and what's real, I guess. Yeah. Well, I could help you out with what's real and not real. All right. You know, with the gas station. If you have questions, um, you know, we have strong reason to believe that you actually used her phone. You don't remember doing that? Because you said you might have. There's that. I don't think so, but I, I could be wrong. You could be wrong? Melinda was, you know, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, was, was brutally attacked. I never even hurt anybody before. And hearing that, what would, how would this happen, that she's so brutally attacked? Because I don't believe that it was an accidental shooting at first because that is one thing and that's something where you could you could do a an oh shit moment and get her help, call, come to us and say this this was a complete accident and we're not sitting here. But when she's shot multiple times and stabbed numerous times, that changes things. So that just leads me to believe that the first one wasn't accidental because the your your actions afterwards suggest completely suggest af, uh, otherwise. Even after five interviews spanning ten hours, Jeff reaches for one last straw, claiming everything after the first shooting feels like a dream. His actions after the murder, however, such as texting Bruce from Mel's phone moving the gun and attempting to put forth his intruder narrative indicate a stark reality. He was cognizant of his actions all along. To this date, Jeff has not disclosed his motive for the murder of Melinda Pleskovic. While it may have been linked to an argument over paternity, prosecutors revealed in court that Jeff's credit card was declined 14 times by the wedding venue where Jeff and Anna Pleskovic were set to marry later the same week of the murder. The venue sent an email to Melinda, advising the wedding would be cancelled. And it's fair to theorize this discovery led Mel to confront Jeff, triggering his rageful attack and her brutal murder. Whatever the case, it's certain that this was no crime of passion, and was indeed premeditated. While Jeff's defense lawyers attempt to argue his confessions were coerced, the judge disagreed. And in October 2018, Jeff pleaded no contest to murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 33 years. At sentencing, the judge noted she had received 51 victim impact statements from members of Mel's family, her friend circle, and the community at large including her students and parents of students. The overwhelming sentiment was that Mel was a much-loved parent, wife, teacher, and friend, and that this was a devastating loss for a tight-knit community.